Hey guys, welcome to another episode. Today we're installing a brand new stainless exhaust system on my Mark 1 Golf. My dad's BMW gets its high pressure fuel pump replaced and the Saab receives a new clutch. So grab a cold drink, sit down and relax because it's going to be a long one. All my Hey guys, so as all of you know, a couple of months ago I was driving my Mark 1 Golf on the Nürburgring when the exhaust decided that it didn't want to exhaust anymore. Uh, pretty much it has broken right after the exhaust manifold, uh, which meant that there were no longer any mufflers attached and I had the privilege to drive the car home for two hours like that, uh, which wasn't really nice. And then when I got home, I just parked the car under my dad's carport and that is sadly where it sat until today. Uh, just to fill you in, currently on the car there is a complete stock exhaust system apart from the stainless headers. So I was thinking am I going to go for a new OEM setup just to replace the stuff that is broken or am I going to go with something aftermarket. But recently I got in contact with the lovely people over at Jetex Exhausts and they were kind enough to supply me with one of their stainless half systems for my Mark 1 Golf. And that is what we are going to be installing in this video. And the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at the entire system. Ooh, stickers. So here we have the first section of tubing. Uh, I think this is the part that goes to the rear muffler. Uh, and also something important to mention is that the entire half system is made out of 50 millimeter uh, section tubing, which is significantly larger than the stock exhaust. Uh, and therefore it should provide us with much more flow. Some fresh hardware. Next, this looks like the central silencer. Oof. This plastic stuff we're going to have to take off. straight pipe one big tip so that is the rear silencer and boy I will have to get used to having such a big tip because right now on the car there is just a tiny cigarette poking out. So here is the entire kit laid out and I think it is a pretty good looking kit especially for the price point it is at uh, and I'm very curious to know what it's going to look and sound like when it is on the car. So it is a pretty grey and rainy day here in Belgium. It's actually pretty depressing also that that is outside but I don't have a choice. Uh, so yeah, what I think I'm going to do is make it a little bit cozy in here. I'm going to put on the wood stove so that it gets a little bit warmer and then we're going to be enjoying a nice Sunday afternoon of ranching. So let's quickly take a look at the current exhaust system. Uh, we have stainless headers here in the front. Those are going to stay. Uh, then this section is missing. That is where uh, the exhaust broke. Uh, and then over here we have the rear muffler and we're going to start with taking that off. Taking it off is pretty easy. There is one bracket here and then two here. Uh, one is already disconnected. So uh, yeah, should be pretty easy to take that off. Yes. 
So I've quickly taken a look at the system uh, and it looks like we're going to have an issue fitting the Jetex exhaust onto the headers that I currently have. So uh, this is the flange that needs to go on here to uh, seal the headers off. And normally the stock exhaust system just simply goes over that and there is no issue. But the section of the Jetex exhaust is much larger than the stock one, which means that this will never work. So uh, yeah, I've been thinking about a solution and I think the way I'm going to solve this is by putting on the flange like so and then we're going to weld all the way around here to seal it off. But the problem is that I can't do that here. Uh, I need somebody who knows how to weld stainless steel. But uh, for the sake of continuing, we're just going to mount it like this to see if the rest of the exhaust fits. This is the next piece. So after also putting on the rear muffler, it seems like everything is lining up pretty well. Uh, remember, nothing has been bolted down, so it's just mocking it up. Uh, only here I did spot a small issue. I think one of those two brackets we're going to have to move because I feel like the exhaust is still sticking out a bit too much uh, and already these are not aligning. So yeah, we're going to have some work there. But now I'm going to take everything down again because as I said before this needs to get welded and I've already found somebody who can do it for me so hopefully tomorrow we can get this sorted. So Elias came in clutch and welded this up for me and I am super grateful. Now we just have to keep our fingers crossed that this will fit. That is lining up beautifully. I'm going to give it one final rub down to remove any oily fingerprints and then we can go for that first start. Okay, let's give it a crank. Let's check for leaks. Okay. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. So at first sight, it seems like the volume of the exhaust is exactly the same as the stock one at idle. Um, I am curious to give it some refs, but uh, in order to do that, I'm going to wait until the engine fully warms up and you can kind of hear that one of my lifters is sticking pretty badly, but uh, I am sure that that is going to go away once the engine has warmed up. That is already sounding lovely, now let's go do some pulls on the street.
So I am pretty happy with the sound that my little Golf is making right now. Uh, it is slightly louder than it was before, but the overall tone is a little bit deeper, which was exactly what I wanted. Uh, I don't really care for cars with really loud and obnoxious exhausts. So this is absolutely perfect and everything I could have wanted. I really want to express my gratitude to Jetex Exhaust for supplying me with one of their awesome kits. Uh, and if you want to take a look at all of the other products that they have to offer, I am going to leave their details in the description below. And now we're moving on to the next car. With the Golf's exhaust done, we can move to the next job that I want to do in this video. Uh, and that is to fix my dad's car. Uh, if you remember in the detailing episode on uh, his 640i, I mentioned that there is a problem with the high pressure fuel system in that car. And uh, everything is looking towards to uh, the high pressure fuel pump being broken. So I'm going to try to replace that in this episode and hopefully we'll sort out the issue. So here we go again boys, a very familiar sight. Uh, I've already disconnected the battery again, uh, that way we can uh, relieve the pressure on the fuel system. Uh, and now I'm going to start with taking off the plastic cover here and the air filter box. The fuel pump is located right here behind the throttle body so for sure we're going to have to remove that. So I'm going to start with just removing stuff here that's going to inhibit from removing that and yeah we'll just figure it out as we go. I think if I loosen the charge pipe now, we should be able to take it off. Okay. Boom, gone. Well boys, I think I ordered the wrong pump. So apparently there are two styles of high pressure fuel pump and I bought the new style while we need the old version. Um, I think the switching point was around March 2012 and I think where the mix up happened was that my dad's car has been first registered in June of 2012 but uh, it might have been constructed way before that so that is where I made my mistake so I'm afraid we're going to have to return the pump that I just ordered then order the correct one which is probably a lot more expensive uh, and that is going to take some time so what I think I'm going to do is put the car back together so that it doesn't sit dead on my lift and then we're going to change the rear brake pads because those are in desperate need of some attention Okay, so the brakes. First, the wheel. First, I'm undoing the connector for the electric parking brake. Next, the caliper. Let's 
set that to the side. Now I'm going to take off the handbrake actuator, which is held in by two T30 Torx screws. This way it is possible to retract the piston. Okay, that should be good. The actuator can go back on. Let's quickly take a look at the sliders. Those seem okay. Some brake loop. I was a bit too fast with the cable for the brake pad wear sensor. It needs to go in between of the caliper. So I have returned the wrong pump and I've did some research to uh, yeah, buy the correct one. And it turns out that they are at least 800 euros, which is pretty expensive. So uh, I dug in a bit more and I noticed that there are people that have attempted to fix these high pressure fuel pumps with some success. Uh, so I might as well give that a try as well. If we mess up the pump, yeah, then we're just going to have to order a new one. But uh, yeah, I think it might be worth giving it a shot. So what I did so far is taking the car back apart to the point where we stopped uh, with the previous project. Uh, and now I'm going to start with taking off the high pressure fuel lines. Uh, and then I think we are ready to unbolt the pump itself. I think everything on the pump is now disconnected, so now we have a couple of torque screws to undo and then we should be able to slide it out. Okay, so here we have the pump and I'll give you a brief explanation of how it works. Over here we have a part that rotates together with the camshaft uh, and that spins the pump on the inside. Here we have the low pressure fuel inlet, so this is the fuel coming from the fuel tank. Uh, and then over here we have a fuel solenoid, which basically is a valve that opens and closes depending on the amount of uh, fuel that is needed. Here we have the high pressure fuel outlet, so this is the fuel that goes into the fuel rail, to the injectors and then eventually in the engine. And then over here this little guy is a diaphragm. Uh, and that is actually important for the diagnosis of this pump. Okay, so basically this pump is completely filled with oil. There should be no air inside of it. Uh, and that means that when this pump heats up, inevitably the oil inside of it will also heat up, uh, which will expand and therefore we need a place for that oil to go to. And that is where this diaphragm or valve comes into play. The oil will expand, the diaphragm will lift ever so slightly, allowing for the space that the oil needs. But I have also read that this diaphragm is preloaded when this pump is new. And you can actually measure inside of it to see how much of that load is left. 
And when we take a look here, we can see that we are at 27 millimeters, which I believe is way too much. Normal values should be around 18 to 17 millimeters. So it might be very possible that there is not enough oil in this pump and that the seal or something similar has broken. So we're going to open this up and maybe we can still save this thing. Also, I need to note that I am an idiot. You actually don't need to undo the bolts on this part because this is just a flange that could have stayed on the engine. There are simply three Allen bolts right here that are much easier to get to and it will allow you to take off the pump as well. Next we're going to take out these three T20 Torx screws. Here we have the three pistons that put pressure on the fuel that sits inside this system uh, and they get pushed in by this eccentric turning disc. So after doing some more research online, I have actually decided that I'm no longer going to continue with the rebuild of this pump. Uh, and the main reason for that is that there is just not enough documentation available on, uh, for example, the part numbers that we are going to need for the seals. And also uh, the oil that needs to go in it is just a big question mark. Nobody knows. So I don't feel comfortable with just taking a guess and then slapping the pump back together. So what we are going to do is bite the bullet and just buy a new pump and that way we are sure that the issue is going to be resolved. And actually I am sure that the cause for our problems was this pump because if you take a look at the displacement of the diaphragm now with all the oil removed it is still exactly the same so that tells me that there was no preload on the diaphragm. Okay guys, so the new pump came in, so in a few minutes we can go ahead and put that back in the car. But I quickly want to show you something. Uh, remember that we talked about this little diaphragm that can be a sign of something wrong in the pump. When we measured the old pump, both with and without oil, it came out at an even 27, 26 millimeters. And if we do that for the new pump, we are at 22. 223 so that is a difference and it is pretty cold in here so if it would heat up that would definitely come down as well so uh, yeah let's hope that i'm right i am 99 percent confident that i am but uh, yeah you never know let's throw it in the car Everything is back together and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that will be it for the fix because uh, yeah, that was far from an enjoyable job. It really makes me uh, appreciate old junk like that way more after working on something like this. And this isn't even that bad, but uh, yeah. So I'm going to connect the battery and we'll give her a crank and let's see what happens. Okay, so I did a couple of starts and it seems to be acting normal. Uh, so now I think we're going to go for a test drive because uh, she would go into limp mode when you would do a very hard acceleration for a long time. So yeah, that's a good excuse to do some of those.
So yesterday night I did about 50 kilometers with my dad's car uh, while pushing it very hard and it didn't break a sweat, no issues at all. Uh, so I think, fingers crossed, that the issue with the stumbly stuff is finally over. Um, one more thing, uh, some people might be interested in how well the uh, ceramic coating is holding up. So let me quickly show you. The car can obviously do with a wash again, but uh, yeah, what can you do? The paint, however, is still pretty shiny. And now let's test the hydrophobic properties. So that result is two months after we first applied the ceramic coating and if you ask me that is not bad at all. So uh, yeah I'm pretty stoked with that and I'm also very happy that the BMW is repaired. So now we can move to the last car we need to fix in this episode and that is the Saab. So the people that have been following the Saab project know that at some point I took apart the clutch because I suspected something was wrong with it. Uh, every time you would set off in first gear the car would be all juddery. So uh, I suspected that the clutch was the issue or maybe the flywheel. So I took it apart, but in doing so I broke a lot of stuff. But now I ordered everything that I needed and broke. So we can put a clutch back into the car. So we've got a new pressure plate and a new clutch. And over here we have the old flywheel, but I got it resurfaced or I think decked is the correct term. I don't know. But uh, you can still see that there are some small imperfections in it. And the guy that did this explain to me that that can happen when there's some excessive heat that went through it but uh, he ensured me that it should feel a lot better like this so we'll try to put it on and hopefully we can finally drive this junk again because i am so sick of pushing it around first we're going to knock in this bearing Okay, let's put her on. I blocked the flywheel, so now we can tighten the bolts to 60 Newton meters. Now I'm going to put the release bearing in place. Okay, so now we can put this clutch sandwich in between of the flywheel and uh, the release bearing. Uh, and if you remember the last time I had issues with um, the pressure plate retracting too much because I didn't use the proper tool to block it. Uh, this time I also don't have the proper tool, but what I did is I used the shop press to depress the teeth of the pressure plate. And then I put a piece of copper tubing in between that hopefully should be uh, enough blockage to where I can slide all of this in. Okay, so we are finally successful uh, and it took me a couple of tries. But uh, what worked well for me was to use some zip ties that uh, are zipped against the teeth of the pressure plate and they are holding the release bearing very tightly into the pressure plate and that allowed me to have just the right amount of space to uh, put the whole sandwich in. I've also already put in the shaft so the clutch is centered uh, so now I can tighten the bolts for the pressure plate and for the release bearing. And let's not forget the little cover plate. Okay, so everything is installed and I've also attached the hydraulic line that goes into the slave cylinder. Um, so next we need to bleed the system and we're going to use my pressure bleeder for that. And then once that the release bearing is back uh, operational, we should be able to take out the copper tubing that I put in between of the pressure plate.
Okay, let's push the pedal. Okay, do it maar op. Okay guys, so the clutch is fully installed and now I am really curious to see if we have solved the issue. So I have pushed the car outside and now we're going to do a little test drive here in my dad's driveway. And hopefully we got rid of those nasty driveline vibrations. Uh, something that I need to mention as well is uh, that since we have welded the car in the rear, I have removed both of the shock absorbers. So uh, the rear axle doesn't have any shock absorbers anymore and the car is going to be a bit wobbly. So uh, please don't pay attention to that. Immediately I can tell that it's much better. Something is up with this clutch. So although the sap is bouncing all over the place, the clutch is now buttery smooth. So that means that we finally solved that issue and that we can move forward with this project. And also, I think effectively in this episode, we made three cars operational again, which is a darn good result if you ask me. It is on awesome days like this where I just enjoy what I'm doing the entire day and feeling fulfilled by the end of the day that I realized that at some point I would want to make a full-time living out of making videos on this platform. And it is with that idea in mind that I decided that uh, I am going to try to open up other sources of income. And one of them that I'm going to use in the near future is going to be reopening my merch store. So as most of you know, in the past I have already sold merch, but uh, I wasn't really happy with the third party that I was working with at the time. So I've decided that from now on, I'm going to be the one who is making the designs and I'm going to ship everything out personally. So I've made two stickers, one of my BMW E28 and one of my Mark 1 Golf. And personally, I think that the designs came out pretty well and the stickers look high quality. So I am personally very happy with that. So if you are interested in either one of these stickers, I'm going to leave the details for my store in the description below. Uh, and keep an eye on it because I am already working on some other stuff as well. That is going to be it for today's video. I want to thank you so much for watching. Uh, I know it has been a long episode and I hope to see all of you in the next one.